The Doomsday Clock is a design that warns the public about how close we are to destroying our world with dangerous technologies of our own making. It is a metaphor, a reminder of the perils we must address if we are to survive on the planet. In 1991, with the end of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, prompting the Bulletin to set the clock to 17 minutes of midnight. In 2023, the Science and Security Board set the time to 90 seconds to midnight. The ancient Greeks were well aware that a paradox could take us outside our usual way of thinking. They combined the prefix para, meaning beyond, or outside of, with the verb dokin, to think, forming paradoxos, an adjective meaning contrary to expectation. Paradox, a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, and yet is perhaps true. The men and women who design the destructive powers do not have control of them once they are unleashed. The Bulletin of Atomic Sciences began as an emergency action undertaken by scientists who saw a need for an immediate educational program about atomic weapons. The intention was to educate fellow scientists about the relationship between the world of science and the world of national and international politics. When the Doomsday Clock was created in 1947, the greatest danger to humanity was the threat of nuclear weapons, including the prospect that the United States and the Soviet Union were headed towards a nuclear arms race. The founder and first editor of the Bulletin was biophysicist Eugene Rabinowitch, who in the early days decided the position of the minute hand based on conversations with fellow contributors, such as Bertrand Russell, Edward Teller, Albert Einstein, and J. Robert Oppenheimer. The design for the clock was conceived by Marta Langsdorff for the first issue of the magazine cover of the June 1947 edition of the Bulletin. At first she considered using the symbol for uranium, but as she listened to the scientists who had worked on the bomb, they passionately debated the consequences of the new technology and their responsibility to inform the public. So she sketched a clock to suggest that we didn't have much time left to get atomic weapons under control. The bulletin focuses on three main areas, nuclear risk, climate change, and disruptive technologies, including developments in biotechnology. What connects these topics is a driving belief that because humans created them, we can control them. The board meets twice a year, with subcommittees meeting more frequently to discuss and determine the appropriate level of risks to humans' survival on Earth. The discussion this fall, which is open to the public, will be hosting one of my favorite directors, Christopher Nolan, as the keynote speaker. Easy, Doyle. Nice and easy. I feel good. Take us home. I have my hang-ups about the docking plot device. Overall, though, one of his best films. If you want to see a full video on the man in his film, say Interstellar in the comments. The metaphor of a clock provides the clarity of a countdown, but the closer the hands get to midnight, the more difficult it is to attempt to accurately reflect the small changes that could push the world closer or further from doomsday. Here's some of the top moments when the clock followed history. The Cold War escalated in the 80s with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, derailing diplomacy and the U.S. increase in military spending. Not to mention Reagan's Star Wars, the clock lunged forward to just three minutes to midnight. On December 25, 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved after a decade of economic ruin and social unrest, leaving four decades of Cold War hostilities in the past. The bulletin marked the occasion as a step into a new era and set the clock back to its furthest point away from midnight in its history, 17 minutes. War, it's good for business. During the 60s, regional wars exploded from the Indo-Pakistan War in 65 to the Six-Day War with Israel in 67, along with the US heating things up in Vietnam. Standing on an easy ground across the globe, the clock stood at seven minutes. 1953, 
friction between the US and the USSR grows. Of course, American scientists design the ultimate thermonuclear destruction, the hydrogen bomb. The Soviets released one shortly after. The bulletin put out a statement. Only a few more swings of the pendulum, and from Moscow to Chicago, atomic explosions will strike midnight for Western civilization. The clock was just two minutes to midnight. And the top of the list goes to, would you believe it? This year. That's right, with a growing global instability hallmarked by the war in Ukraine, China increasing their nuclear arsenal, the threat of bioweapons and disinformation spreading, and the efforts to combat climate change faltering, 2023 has turned out to be the closest our species has ever faced total annihilation. 90 seconds to midnight. Hey. Plato said the measure of a man is what he does with power. What do you think about the uses of power from this list? How do you define morality in these circumstances? Or is that a question that should never be asked at that level of decision making? The paradox in predicting the apocalypse lies in the fact that it might not come from a purposeful action, rather from the common mistake of human fallibility. In 1975, one of those accidents happened. The United States Navy helped secure the freedom of countries a thousands of miles away. On November 22nd, during night exercises, the aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy collided with the cruiser USS Belknap in rough seas 70 miles east of Sicily. The collision caused major damage to both ships, with the Belknap superstructure wedged underneath the overhanging flight deck of the carrier. A raging fire punctuated with explosions lasted for more than two hours. No mention has ever been made of the nuclear weapons present aboard both ships or the grave danger the Navy believed the nuclear warheads aboard the Belknap faced as a result of the fires. Minutes after the incident occurred, the commander of Carrier Striking Forces for the 6th Fleet sent a secret nuclear weapons accident message, a broken arrow, to the Pentagon, warning of the high probability that nuclear weapons aboard the Belknap were involved in fire and explosions. He had good reason for concern. The top three Department of Defense definitions for an accident involving nuclear weapons is known as a pinnacle or incident of interest to the major commands, DOD, and the National Command Authority in that it generates a higher level of military action, causes a national reaction, affects an international relationships and national policy, and widespread media coverage. A Ben Spear incident includes violations and breaches of handling and security regulations surrounding nuclear weapons. Broken Arrow incidents fall into a category of not creating a risk of nuclear war. However, involve accidental or unexplained detonations, nuclear explosions, radioactive contamination, jettison or lost weapons, and public hazard. The last one is, well, the one movies are made about. A Nuck Flash is any incident, accidental or unintentional, involving detonation of a nuclear weapon on or near another nuclear-capable country. The reason for the secrecy was highly political. It relates to the U.S. Navy's policy of neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear weapons aboard its ships. If they had admitted that the Belknap and the Kennedy were carrying nuclear warheads, the Navy would be forced to deal with the controversy, if not the restrictions, that could accompany port calls at nations that are not eager to have nuclear weapons introduced into their territory. Was the Belknap a unique and isolated incident? Hardly. The record shows that it was perhaps the most dramatic of an otherwise commonplace event. In 1988, Greenpeace and the Institute for Policy Studies began looking into the Navy's record. Overall, the study showed that world's navies have experienced at least 1,200 major accidents, which have resulted in dozens of ships sinking, hundreds of explosions and fires, costly repairs, and loss of life. The accidents have occurred in shipyards and ports, harbors and coastal waters, and on the high seas throughout the world. And they have left an astounding byproduct, 50 nuclear warheads and nine nuclear reactors lying on the ocean floor. Now, I'm singling out the United States for good reason. I'm an American and I wanna know what's going on. I think I have a right to accountability and so do you. 
Our U.S. defense has served us well, and it is a tribute to the care taken by the managers of these precarious technologies that no real catastrophe has yet occurred. But I want to shed light on the unbelievable horrors and mistakes that can happen, which incidentally could lead to more extreme reactions elsewhere that are far beyond myself or anyone else's control. That one extra mistake, one more accidental oops, could inevitably start a chain of events that is irreversible. My concern is not for the US military and their practices so much as it is a larger question about the nature of these technologies and why they are still so prevalent. That being said, it's truly astonishing the amount of accidents and testing that has taken place. Are you ready? Don't blink. You mentioned it. Yeah. In December 1953, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, in his Atoms for Peace proposal, urged that an international organization be established to disseminate peaceful nuclear technology while guarding against development of weapons capabilities in additional countries. I feel impelled to speak today in a language that, in a sense, is new. That new language is the language of atomic warfare. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace that every citizen of the world should have some comprehension, at least in comparative terms, of the extent of this development. The speech was part of a carefully orchestrated media campaign called Operation Candor to enlighten the American public on the risks and hopes of a nuclear future. During the 1950s, many countries developed large civil defense programs designed to aid the populace in the event of nuclear warfare. These generally included drills for evacuation to fallout shelters, popularized through media such as the U.S. film Duck and Cover. The growing resentment and impending doom of such endeavors led to mass movements around the world rejecting the ideas of proliferation and constant war. In 1958, British activism and later the campaign for nuclear disarmament inspired what we now know as the peace symbol. In 1965, Andy Warhol based Atomic Bomb Red Explosion on a newspaper image of a mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. Many films, some of which were based on novels, feature a nuclear war or the threat of it, Broken Arrow with John Travolta and Christian Slater centers around a military pilot going rogue and stealing a nuclear warhead for ransom. I say, God damn, what a rush. You gotta love that one. When it comes to music, look no further than 99 Luft Balloons by the German group Nina, which depicts accidental nuclear war begun by an early warning system identifying a group of balloons with enemy bombers or missiles. The title of Linkin Park's third studio album, Minutes to Midnight, is a reference to the hands of the Doomsday Clock. As far as video games go, the Fallout series contains numerous direct and indirect allusions to nuclear wars and potential nuclear holocaust, with a distinct 1950s Cold War style. And I'll even throw in Duke Nukem, since it's literally his namesake. It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of gum. As long as the threat of nuclear war is upon us, these references and illusions will continue. However, the paradox is they are so woven into the fabric of society that they almost become invisible or meaningless. How often do you pass by a symbol or reference to something and stop to think about its nature or why it's there? We're in a constant state of consumption, usually passive in nature, where the motive for meaningful outward action becomes less important to the feeling about the state of the world around us. Adams for Peace was a propaganda component of the Cold War strategy of containment. Eisenhower's speech opened a media campaign that would last for years and that aimed at emotion management, balancing fears of continuing nuclear armament with promises of peaceful use of nuclear technologies. Does it not feel like this is still a pervasive campaign? To muddy the waters of dissent is the status quo. Even the bulletin of atomic scientists at their core state that they're a media organization However, they offer meaningful resources and actionable content. We have a shared interest in the survival of humanity, which the more conversations we have about the topic, 
the more confidence we have to make meaningful change to reverse the trend of an increasingly polarized world. 90 seconds to midnight is a little too close for comfort. Is it for you? I appreciate you tuning into Mindful Entertaining History. Your thoughts and comments are always welcome here. If you have a strange or obscure topic that you would like to see covered, just drop me a line. We want to win your support to continue making content. Content that I find intriguing hopefully rings true with you as well. My name is Evan. That's Minerva. Man. You can say that again. We hope you take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thank you.